Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. Glad you made it back after all the holidays, right? We got one more coming up, New Year's, but glad to see that you all made it back after Christmas. Our uh, praise team appears to have been enjoying the eggnog, so. <laughs> but they're in good spirits, which is great. I love that, so good to see you all. Well, Advent is over, so I'm starting a new series. This new particular series is called Dangerous Doctrine. Danger Everything wrong with prosperity gospel is what I'm going to talk about this week. But the series is called Dangerous Doctrine. The reason why is because ideas have consequences. Things that we believe, things that we teach, act out in real life. So we have to be very careful to make sure that we are teaching and believing the right thing. And I want to talk about the prosperity gospel. I think it's one of the most dangerous teachings out there. I believe it preys upon those who are weak and vulnerable and makes promises that it cannot deliver. The prosperity gospel has been around long enough that even Time Magazine has done articles on it. But the big question, does God want you to be rich? And nowhere in the Bible does it say that God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be prosperous, but prosperous and rich are not necessarily the same thing. God wants to bless you with an abundant life, but an abundant life and having a lot of money are not the same thing. However, if you twist Scripture, you can kind of convince people that God wants you to be rich. Oh, there's one of my favorite people in the world, oh, Peter Popoff, okay? He's one of those people, he's one of those, really bothers me because this guy was exposed for the fraud that he was on live national television and he, you know, shut down that ministry and just opened another one and everybody keeps following him. I have pointed out on my blog that he's now hawking miracle spring water, okay? He will send you miracle spring water, and you have to follow a very complicated set of instructions of what to do with this miracle spring water. You have to take the little miracle spring water, put it under your pillow, right? You have to do this within 24 hours. Within 24 hours of receiving the envelope and opening it, you must put it under your pillow, sleep on it for the day. After having spoken a magic spell that, uh, I'm sorry, after speaking certain words of scripture that he says, you have to speak over the miracle water, and then afterwards you have to drink it, and also send him a check. And if you do all these things, you do it in the right way, and you believe enough and you have enough faith, you'll get a whole bunch of money. I'm still waiting for my whole bunch of money. <laughs> anyway, I put up a blog post about him. I'm like, really? You people are falling for this scam? I explained where the scam came from and all that kind of stuff. And somebody commented back. Somebody decided they needed to argue with me about this. This is what they wrote to me. The guy's name is Zarar Gotham, and on December 11, 2019, this is what he wrote to me. He says, all you jobless folks and critics of men of God, why do you mingle on matters which you know little of? Now, I've been many things, but nobody has ever accused me of being jobless. I'm like, are you kidding? You don't even know me, right? And apparently, you know, you read this singular blog post, but didn't bother to click on my bi biography where it says I'm a college professor. Right? I am not a jobless. And why do you mingle right, on matters which you know little of? Well, I don't know. I know a little bit about this stuff. <laughs> Apparently, he didn't read those parts about my various degrees and whatnot in theology, but that's okay. Right? Critics of the men of God. I'm like, this guy is not a man of God. This guy is a huckster and a con artist, and I have no problem saying that. Okay? You want to who spells want to like that? Anyway, you want to criticize seed faith and word of faith. Really? Yes, really. I'm more than happy to criticize it because it's a con, right? Please. All right. Since he asked nice, I'll go on. All right. You better go mow your grass or at least do something. First off, I don't mow the grass. All right. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's not because, it's simply because I'm allergic to grass, right? And when there's fresh mowed grass, I go into an asthma attack. So I don't mow the grass, so that's just not going to happen. He goes on to say, seed faith is the life of Christianity. So the only comment that I sent back to him was, wow, are you way off base? Seed faith is not the life of Christianity. Jesus is the life of Christianity. 
If you think seed faith is the life of Christianity, you completely miss the central point of Christianity, which is Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. What's the answer? Jesus. I grew up in Sunday school. I know the answer is always Jesus. Or 40 days and 40 nights. Those are the two, right? Okay. Get it now, or you will get it then, when you stand in front of the Lord. I always like this because fundagelicals love to give you a little bit of fear. They're always trying to throw the fear of hell in you. So I did make the second comment. He's like, okay, seed faith is the life of Christianity. I'm like, no, it's Jesus. And don't try to scare me with hell. I'm a universalist. It's kind of pointless, right? Peter Popoff is a real man of God. Uh Uh-uh. Okay, he reached there because of his relationship with God. No, he reached there because there's a lot of gullible people in the world. You too have hope if you return, return, repent before it's too late. So I suppose I'm supposed to send him a check or something. I don't know how that works. Okay. But this man is dangerous. He makes millions every year. But here's what really irritates me about him is that he specifically markets and targets all his letters, all his advertisement towards poor black communities. He prays specifically on poor black communities because they tend to be more Pentecostal. So I have a problem with this. And I think that we need to call these kind of hucksters and con men out and say enough is enough. So what is the prosperity gospel after all? Well, it's a doctrine that teaches financial blessing and health are always the will of God for them, and that faith, positive speech, and donations will increase one's material wealth. The problem I have with that is the word always, because that's not true. See, one of the dangerous ideas behind this doctrine is if you don't have money, if you're sick, is because you're a bad Christian. You have no faith. I can't buy that. Because I know some of the most amazing Christians with extremely deep faith who are in pain and who are suffering. And this idea of the prosperity gospel communicates to them, you lack faith, there's something wrong with you. And there's nothing wrong with them. And it puts them in a place of despair. It puts them on a course of self-examination for sin and problems in their own life when there are none. Where did, where did the prosperity gospel come from? That's kind of an interesting question because it comes from a lot of different sources. You can't just point to one individual and say, it started here. But I'm going to point out a couple of the major influences of it. There are a lot more, but here's just a few of them. One, it comes from our Puritanism and Calvinism. For those of you who don't know, Calvinists came up with the idea of predestination, that God has already chosen who's going to be in heaven and who's not. And our Puritan forefathers brought this up with them to the United States. And so the question is, how do you know that you're one of those people who are actually saved? How do you know that God has chosen you? How do you know that you are one of the chosen? And the Puritan's answer was, well, God will bless you financially. You'll prosper in everything that you do. So this is kind of where the Puritan work ethic came from. You worked really hard to earn a lot of money because if you had a lot of money, if you had houses, if you had cattle, if you had all this good stuff, It means that you are one of the chosen. God is blessing you. And so sort of this idea that, oh, rich people are blessed by God. Is that true? Are rich people blessed by God? Sometimes rich people are just the biggest robbers in the room. It doesn't mean that they're special. It doesn't mean they're blessed by God. Material wealth is seen as a sign of God's blessing and that the wealthy are spiritually superior. That's a problem. Because if I remember the way that Jesus taught it, he said, blessed are the poor. And as Paul taught it, he says, because of your poverty, you have an even better relationship with God than those who depend upon their wealth. I put up this picture here. This is Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie. One of the original robber barons. How he accumulated his wealth was literally to destroy other companies. He had no problem resorting to violence to put down workers who demanded better pay, better working conditions, better rights. He did every immoral and unethical thing you can imagine to accumulate his wealth. But as he got towards the end of his life, he's like, I need to talk about wealth for a second. And he wrote a little article, it's called The Gospel of Wealth, in which he points out that, well, the wealthy are superior. 
that's why we're wealthy. And we need to like hold on to all the money and we will distribute it to, you know, those who deserve it. We will give to charity, but we can only give to people who deserve it. We don't want to give it to lazy people. We don't want to give it to... And this idea from his gospel of wealth has trickled down into our culture. Because every day, as we encounter people who are homeless, who are on the street, we make a decision about whether or not they are deserving or not, and whether or not we will help them. And we still have this idea that somehow wealthy people are there because they're better at something than anyone else. We don't look at a rigged economy and say, well, maybe it's just because they're better thieves than the rest of us. There's an interesting person. You've probably never heard of him or seen him before. Okay, this is E.W. Kenyon. And he brought in what we now call New Thought. New Thought has sort of a long history to itself as well. Anybody know who Franz Mesmer is? Franz Mesmer? It's where we get the word mesmerize. He was an early practitioner of hypnosis. And he wrote a book about how, through the hypnotic state, the powers of the mind can be unreleased, and that it's our thoughts, our thoughts shape reality. So a lot of things came off of this idea that our thoughts shape reality. His book was plagiarized by a guy named Phineas Parks Quimby, and then re-plagiarized by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy who came up with Christian science. And so E.W. Parks, borrowing from all of them, began writing about it's really our thoughts and our profession of faith that shapes reality. If we will just proclaim it and believe it, then reality will conform to whatever we claim and believe. And this, of course, was picked up by others like Norman Vincent Peale, Robert Schuller, a lot of other people. So we get a lot of this idea that if we proclaim it in faith and we really believe it, we will change reality. We call it by a lot of different things. Sometimes you'll hear it called, you know, the word of faith movement. But it's the heart of the prosperity gospel, that as long as you believe it will happen, it will actually happen. I can tell you that's not true. We had a longtime church member here who's no longer with us. He's passed on. He believed aliens were going to land any day. And he really believed it, and it never happened. You can believe it, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. God is in control of reality, not us, not our minds. So he put in this, we shape reality by our positive thoughts. So just confess it, just name it, just claim it. Need a new car? Then just say, the Lord's going to give me a Cadillac. By the way, I was watching one of these guys on TV the other day, because, you know, I have nothing better to do with my life then watch a bunch of evangelicals on TV. And I thought it was kind of funny because he's one of these guys, you know, he's praying for all his TV audience out there. You'll never see me do this. I will never do this in my life. But he's praying for all of his, right? And, and, he, and he's, he's going through one of these and he's like, oh yes, oh yes, I see someone. You're getting a brand new car. Yes, you're getting a new Cadillac. And then the very next thing out of his mouth was, and, and, and I see someone else, yes, Yes, you're getting a loan for a new car. I'm like going, if you can just kind of speak a new car into creation, skip the loan and just give them the car, you know. But no, this other person just gets the loan. I'm like going, I hope they check the interest rate on that, you know. Anyway. It's all about faith for him. That if you have faith, you can move mountains. Now, if you've been around me long enough, I believe that verse, that if you have even the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. But I have a corollary to it. You can only move the mountain if God tells you to move that mountain. See, that's what faith is all about. God says, go move that mountain. I believe that God spoke it to me. I will go do it. But if God didn't say it, I can believe it all I want and proclaim it all I want. It's not going to happen. By the way, there's a third corollary to that too. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains, but only if God tells you to. And oftentimes, right after he tells you to, and you say, yes, Lord, I will, he hands you a shovel. That mountain will get moved. It won't be easy and it won't be fast, but it's going to happen. 
Ah, yes, these guys. Anybody recognize Oral Roberts? Oral Roberts is the one who really helped popularize this whole prosperity gospel, word of faith and all that kind of stuff. But the picture next to him is the Reverend Gene Ewing, con man extraordinaire. The Reverend Gene Ewing got in trouble because he was supposedly running St. Matthew's Church, which did not exist. It had no physical location. It was a by mail only church. And he sent out millions of letters for St. Matthew's Church. And inside he had this little piece of paper printed. It had a picture of Jesus with his eyes closed. And what you had to do was you had to take this sacred prayer cloth of Jesus and you would pray and you would stare at it. And when Jesus' eyes opened, you knew you were about to be blessed. And if you sent in a check to St. Matthew's, God would multiply it tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. So the bigger check you sent, the more you were going to get back. He's the guy who invented that scam. And he made millions. Lives out here in California, by the way. One day, he decided that he needed to buy an old jet that belonged to Oral Roberts. And Oral Roberts was having a problem. His donations had gone way down and his church was in trouble. And old Gene said, not a problem. I can tell you how to do money. And he taught Oral Roberts the prosperity gospel. And he said, you just send out letters that look like this. And suddenly, Roberts was able to afford a new jet. All the money just keeps rolling in. Prosperity gospel in its current form comes from a huckster and a con man. And if you're buying into it, it's dangerous. So that's where it came from. It came from our Calvinistic roots that believe that God only blesses those who are extra spiritual and that it's some kind of financial blessing. It comes from new thought that by our thoughts will somehow change reality. And it comes from hucksters and con men. They came up with the idea of seed faith. Oh, you take a, you take a little money, that's your seed, and you plant it, and God will grow it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say this. Nowhere. God wants you healthy and wealthy, but you must plant a seed of faith to harvest and access God's provision. I think of the story in the Bible when the man comes and he's seeking healing. Jesus asked him, do you believe? He says, I believe, but help my unbelief. This man did not have the faith. And yet Jesus healed him anyway. Your healing, your prosperity is not dependent upon how much faith you have. That is a lie. That is a lie direct from the pit of hell. Because I'll tell you what. You take any faith healer you want who tells you that your healing is dependent upon faith, you take a baseball bat to their knee and we'll find out how much faith they got. I can guarantee you it won't be enough for them to stand up again. There's a lot of scripture twisting going on. Now, I have probably two dozen letters from Peter Popoff. See, I sent him one letter, right? Asked for his miracle spring water. And I got two dozen letters asking for donations. And he also sold my name to Joyce Meyer. She sent me about 15 at this point. And they use the same scriptures over and over again. So I just want to point out a few of these scriptures that they love to twist. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And they claim that having life to the full is about having material possessions. But if you read this verse in context, it has nothing to do with material possessions. This is all about having an abundant life spiritually. This is about if you come to me the blessing that you will receive is that you will live out your full purpose for what you were intended to be. The idea behind this is that you are created in the image of God, and by coming to me and becoming like me, you return to that image of God, and your life will be what it's supposed to be. Kind of think of it like this. A hammer has a certain purpose, and a screwdriver has a certain purpose. And if you try to use a hammer as a screwdriver, it doesn't work very well. Human beings have a certain purpose. So what he's saying is stop trying to use a hammer as a screwdriver and go back to using a hammer like a hammer. In other words, come back, repent to what you were created to be. And that's going to fulfill your purpose. You're going to have the abundant life that way. 
And that's what he's talking about in this verse. But they turn it and they twist it into, well, he wants to give you money. If God wants to give me money, he knows my address, he can drop it off. He doesn't need me to do anything. How about 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? They love to do this one. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that, through, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now again, in context, this is Paul writing, he's talking about God becomes poor. He becomes incarnate. He is born as an impoverished child. And through his incarnation, we all receive the riches of God's salvation. This is about salvation. How do I know this is not about money? Because just a few short verses later, Paul encourages all of them to sell off their wealth so they can have spiritual wealth instead. Oh, this one always gets me. I've seen this in so many of the letters that they've sent me. This is from 3 John, which we just went through, verse chapter two, verse uh, 2. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. They try to position this as God is saying this, that God wants you to have physical health and material wealth. This, but this is not God talking. This is John the Elder talking to his friend. It's the greeting of a letter. It's like, I hope you're in good health. That's it. There's no biblical promise here. This is not God speaking this. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my favorites, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God wants to prosper you. Why aren't you cooperating by sending me money? But again, this is a spiritual prosperous. He wants you to live an abundant life, one that is fulfilling your purpose, not to have money. This is not about money. John 14, 14, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Isn't this a great verse to take out of context? Just ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And unfortunately, the American church has thought, well, you just tack on Jesus' name at the end of any prayer and then you can get whatever you want. In fact, I've even been criticized sometimes. You know, people are like, you're supposed to pray in Jesus' name at the end and you didn't say in Jesus' name, you just said amen. Or you prayed, you know, to the Father. You didn't pray to Jesus. You didn't do it in his name. You didn't put that at the end. There's something wrong with you. I'm like, what? I'm like, you do not understand this verse. Because when we say, if you ask for anything in my name, we have to understand in that culture, names represented the person and their character. If you come in the name of the king, you represent the king and who he is. But you are also expected not to do anything to tarnish that name, not to do anything out of character, not to do anything the king himself would not do. So when we pray in Jesus' name, it means we pray according to his will and his character. If you ask anything, if you just switch out that word name into if you pray according to my will, if you pray according to my character, it will be given to you. So let's look at some of the things that Jesus asked for. What did he ask for? That God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You ask for faith, he'll give it to you. You ask for patience, which you should never do. He'll give you every opportunity to develop it. But this is about asking for the same things that Jesus asked for. Jesus asked that God forgive his enemies. Jesus asked that blessings would fall upon those who hated him. Are we praying for those things? Or are we praying for a new car? Or just a loan? Somebody's getting a loan. I hope it's got to get into straights. So why is this doctrine so dangerous? Why am I so opposed to this? Well, here's the first reason. It creates a false hierarchy of spiritual elites. Well, if they're wealthy, it means they're extra special spiritual. So people like Peter Popoff, who has busy ripping off everybody, Oral Roberts, who ripped everybody off, Jim Baker, who ripped everybody off, served a jail sentence, turned around and came back, opened a new ministry to rip everybody off. Robert Chilton, convicted of fraud, served a jail sentence, came back, opened a new ministry, he's busy ripping everybody off again. These frauds who have been convicted of crimes turn around and they keep doing it and people keep buying into it. And they present themselves as spiritually elite. Creflo Dollar, 
God has blessed me because I'm extra faithful to him. No, God has blessed you because there's a lot of gullible people who buy into your nonsense. That's the only reason that they have money. Have you ever noticed that the only people who get prosperous in the prosperity gospel are the hucksters who sell this nonsense? And they have left people in poverty. There are no spiritual elites. There are no spiritual elites. There are no special people who have extra spiritual levels. I am no more spiritually elite than you are. We merely have the body of Christ. And all of us bring our gifts together. And we are all equal in the body of Christ. Whether we are a new beginner or an aged elder within the faith, there are no spiritual elites because we can learn something from everyone. And everybody has their gifts to share. And whether you have a dollar in your pocket or a thousand dollars in your pocket, it has no indication of what your spiritual health is. Do you know what the indication of your spiritual health is? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Are you looking more like Christ? How much Christ do I see in you when I look at you? That tells me how healthy your spiritual life is not how much you have. Blessed are the poor, says Jesus. If there's anybody who's spiritually elite, it's going to be the poor. Jesus had a special place in his heart for them. Jesus must have liked poor people because he made a whole bunch of them. But it's poor people who are dependent, and dependent upon God, that oftentimes have to trust him the most. It's a works theology. Now we'll go back to our Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, right? It's not by works that we're saved, but through faith. But prosperity gospel is a work theology. See, you have to have the faith. Faith is something that I generate. Faith is something that I have. I have to create this weird spiritual force. It's all about me. See, I have to plant the seeds. I have to do everything. See, because God apparently can't do anything until I do it first. That's not Christianity. Christianity is about grace. Christianity is about a God that reaches down to you and says, I know you're stuck. I know you're messed up. And I love you anyway. And I'm going to reach down and I'm going to help you out of that. I'm going to do it for you. In fact, I will even die on your behalf. I do the work and you just receive it. It's a gift of grace. So I think it twists the very heart of the gospel and turns it into works theology. God's grace and power are suddenly removed. Poor God, he'd like to bless you, but he can't because you don't have enough faith. Poor God, he's just powerless. He can't do anything for you because you haven't sent a check yet. If you'd only send a check, well, then God would release the blessings of heaven. Said Jesus, never. It distracts from the real, world, real problems of the world. See, suddenly it all comes down to, well, it's all about faith and spiritual blessing. No, it's not. The real problem in this world is an issue of justice, that we have an unjust society and culture. That's the problem of the world. I get so sick and tired of hearing people who point at minorities and impoverished groups and say, well, they're lazy. They don't work. They don't do this. They don't do it's their own fault. No, it's not. They are born into a system that is rigged against them. They are born into a system where one percent controls most of the wealth in this world and have hoarded resources for themselves. They have more money than they can ever spend. They have more money than there's actual physical goods to give them. And so this whole idea of wealth is absurd. And it leaves people impoverished. And that's an issue with God because God calls us to social justice. That if you have more than you need, you need to share it. And we need to start calling people out on this, especially pastors and preachers. People who say, well, you know, I'm here representing God. Yeah? Then why are you living in a $17 million mansion and have 
a different car. As Creflo Dollar says, I have seven Cadillacs, so I don't have to drive the same car every day. You know what? You better freaking sell six of those and become a man of God. <laughs> it makes me mad. But God calls us to create a just world. See, when things are done in heaven as they are done on earth, then earth will become a just place. It's a con that prays the poor and the sick. There are desperate people out there. There are desperately sick people out there who have in-stage terminal cancer and other diseases, and they turn to these hucksters and they turn to these condiments and they write them a check. And they take themselves off their medications and they stop their treatments because they think somehow that God's going to heal them by sending a check in. And it preys upon these people. I have news for all of you. We're all going to die. Some of us, unfortunately, will suffer as well. But our suffering serves purpose. If you don't believe that, read C.S. Lewis's the, the Problem of Pain. Our suffering serves a redemptive purpose. And we will all pass through death. And we need not to be afraid of that. For even when we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us. And when we cross over to the other side, that is a great and joyous moment. Yes, we will grieve those who leave us. But what a joy for them to leave behind the burdens of this life. It cons these poor, sick people. It cons those who are impoverished. They think that somehow by giving a rich person even more money, they're going to get a little bit of it and will be blessed. And there are people who have given away their last dollar. They have taken food out of, their own, out of the mouths of their own children for somebody who has no idea who they are, who will just open an envelope, pull the check out and cash it, and never give them another thought. It's predatory, and it's dangerous. What is true abundance? What is it that God promises us? He doesn't promise us material wealth. What does he truly promise us? This is from Philippians 4, 10 through 13. Now I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have revived your concern for me. You are indeed concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul is writing a thank you letter. Thank you for the money you sent to me. I know you were concerned about me and you were able to provide this money to take care of my needs. I'm not saying that you were bad because you didn't send it. I'm saying I know that you guys are poor yourself and you didn't have the opportunity to send me any money. So I'm thanking you, thanking you for reaching in to whatever you had and sending it to me. I'm not saying this out of need, for I have learned to be content regardless of my circumstances. That, my friends, is true abundance. If you can learn the secret of contentment, you will have a blessed and abundant life. If you can learn the secret of contentment, you'll be happy your entire life. I know how to live humbly and I know how to abound. I am accustomed to any and every situation, to being filled and being hungry, to having plenty and to having need. And this is a verse they twist all the time. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can be content in all all any outward circumstances. This is not one of those, if I just have enough faith, I can accomplish the impossible. That's not what this verse says. This is, I can be content in any circumstance. Now, I'll tell you, I think this is one of those things, and I'm, I'm so glad for, for Michael, because he's able to enjoy a 50 cent hot dog or a $50 steak. I mean, we, you know, when we travel, we love street food. Love street food. I mean, if you really want to know what a culture is like, you eat the street food. You don't go to some fancy Michelin star restaurant to find out what their cuisine is like. Go look to see where everybody's lining up in front of some cart and go eat that. Then you really understand, right? 
I can't pass one of those street dog vendors down in L.A. without getting one of those beautiful bacon-wrapped hot dogs with all the mayonnaise and other stuff on it, okay? There's American culture right there, right there. You want to know what it's like to be an American? You eat one of those. It's so bad for you, you can literally fill your arteries just clogging up at that moment. Don't think of it as hardening the arteries. Just think of it as firming them up. Nobody wants flabby arteries. But see, that's the thing. I know people who cannot be happy and enjoy that 50-cent hot dog. They can't. I can't eat that. They can't be happy unless they've overpaid for a steak. Well, I can't eat here. I mean, what is this? This is like some run-down coffee shop. Well, that's where they have the best food. You know, that's where you get real gravy. Right? But unless they've paid $75, $85, $105 for a steak, they can't be happy. And you know what? Those people are going to be miserable most of their lives because nothing's ever going to be good enough for them. You have to learn to be content with whatever you get. Whatever God brings to you and puts into your hand, enjoy it. Whether you're staying in a palatial room that, that night in Vegas or you're in a cheap hotel, enjoy it. Whether you're seat, sitting in the cheap back row balcony seats or front middle down there in the orchestra, enjoy it. Whatever God gets, enjoy what you have. There are too many people who can't enjoy what God gives them because it's not good enough. If you can learn to be content, you will be happy. You will be happy. True abundance is to live out the image of God within you. True abundance is to produce the fruits of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and patience, all of those things. Because that's what we were meant to be. And when you are living the life you were meant to live, you will be happy. Nowhere in there does it say greedy. Nowhere in there does it say rich. Nowhere in there does it say unethical. Nowhere in there does it say, I will do anything to acquire money, even destroy other people's lives and companies. That's not what makes us happy. It isn't dependent on outward circumstances. True abundance is not dependent on outward circumstances. Whether you're sharing an apartment with a whole bunch of other people or living in a mansion by yourself, if you can't enjoy it, you're not going to be happy. So how do we live this out? How do we reject the prosperity gospel and live all this out? What should we be doing? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? This is not a call to don't even think about it. Don't even think about your basic needs. Just hope it all should. No, this is, and this is a poor translation because they all are a poor translation at this point. This is about don't worry obsessively about what you're going to eat. Oh, I can only eat pheasant under glass. That's brought in by a herd of virgins. <laughs> and served on a tablecloth with a 3,000 thread count. <laughs> under a full moon. If it's not that, I just can't. See, this is worrying obsessively about what shall I eat. This is worrying obsessively about what shall I wear. There are some people who are so <sighs> obsessed with what the current fashion is. And our fashion at this point now changes every 20 minutes. I mean, they even have a term for it. It's called fast fashion. Things go in and out of fashion so quickly you can't keep up. And if you're spending money to always dress fashionably, forget it. You'll never catch up. You're always 20 minutes behind. I've worn the same fashion for the last 30 years. I think if it, my students freak out if they see me in anything other than a pair of blue jeans and a polo shirt. They don't even recognize me. They're like, is that you? I didn't recognize you. Shut up. 
but seek first his kingdom, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek God's kingdom, a kingdom of justice, a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom of compassion, a kingdom that builds a bigger table. Hey, you know, I got to tell you, you know, that is one thing that I do like about my family. You know, now, as I often tell you, I'm only a couple generations removed from hillbilly, right? My great-grandmother was illiterate. She lived in the Appalachian Mountains. She didn't have a lot. She was a sustenance farmer who, hold, who had a chicken farm. And if people dropped in at mealtime, not a problem. Pull up the piano bench. Well, drag in that barrel from outside. You know, here, put a couple of boards on it. Hey, bigger table. Oh, we need a tablecloth. Well, go in the bedroom and get the sheet and throw it over. Everybody was always welcome. And that's what we need to do. That's what the kingdom of God is. Everybody is always welcome. And if there's not room at our table right now, not a problem. We'll just drag a few more chairs in. We'll just make do. We'll figure it out. See, you practice that, and all these other things will be added to you. Everything that you need will be added to you. The things that you need. God's not promising you Gucci fashions. God's not promising you $75 steaks. But he will provide your basic needs. And if you can enjoy those, you will be happy. I put this picture up because this is a common thing that happens right after Christmas. I've heard so many parents say this. My own parents said it about me and my brother, right? We bought them this fabulous gift and all they did was play with the box. You know why? Because kids know contentment. It's something they already know. We train them to be unhappy. I have seen kids entertain themselves. I used to do mission trips to Mexico, right? We go down in these little villages. These are villages that are literally built in the middle of the huge agricultural farms that they are all working. And we go into these little villages, right, so that we could spend some time with them and do some ministry and stuff with them. And they're like, well, how do we get everybody's attention? I said, watch this, right? And I'd grab a soccer ball from the van, put it down. I don't even play soccer, right? So I go down there, and I just, kick, I just walk down the street, and I just kick the ball a little bit. Pretty soon, three or four kids are coming out these doors and a couple more. And I got like 50 kids following me. I just go to a big empty field, and I kick the soccer ball out there. Next thing you know, there's two soccer teams. And they're playing, and they're having a good time for hours, for hours. With what? One measly little soccer ball. I've seen kids pick up sticks, and the stick is probably the greatest toy ever invented. It's a magic wand. It's a staff. It's everything. They know contentment. Is this what I have? I have a stick? Great. This is the greatest thing ever. Yay, stick. One soccer ball for 50. Great. Let's have a good time. Empty box. Oh, my gosh. Who knows what they're thinking about that box right now? Is that the cockpit of a, of a jet engine that they're flying? Is it a sled they're sli you know, sledding down a mountain in? Is it a time machine? What is it? Who knows? But they're so happy. It doesn't take a lot to make a kid happy. We're the ones who make them unhappy because, well, they've got to have just the right toy and the special toy. Is it educational? Does it stimulate their brain? You know what stimulates their brain? That right there. Their brain is now being stimulated with imagination. If we could learn to go back to that, I have a box? Awesome. Let's do something with it. I have a stick? Terrific. I have a ball? Do you realize with a ball, we can play baseball? Come on. I can like share with like nine other people, 18 other people if you count two teams. If we could go back to whatever God gives us that we're happy with it then we are living the abundant life because this is what God is promising you. God never promises you that if you send a check to some huckster that you're going to get money. But he does promise you that if you live according to his principles, that whatever you have, you can be happy with. Seeking his kingdom first. If you'd like to talk to us about this message or to
discuss it more, you can always find our emails and, and uh, contact information on the website and on the back of your bulletin. All right, out and about fellowship, outreach, and inreach. That must be Stanton. All right. Try to calm down. <laughs> Just. All right, thanks, Arthur.